So good morning. Glad that you can join us. Um, the governor mentioned that he may be starting on, uh, let's see, you know, April, May 1st, be starting to lift some of the uh, restrictions. And one of the things that they were starting off lifting was uh, the religious gatherings, basically church services. So we're hoping, we'll let you know through an announcement, through a lot of things, that we might be able to meet. We'll have to observe the physical distancing. We know that families would be able to sit together, but not too close to other people. We're not sure exactly how this is going to go. It may be put off for another few weeks. We, we just don't know. But until then, I'm glad that we can meet together like this. And we need to pray. We need to pray for our country, for our, our the world, for all the nations, that this virus would be contained, that we would be able to, that God would give us whatever we need, uh, vaccination, um, any kind of medications. You know what we really need? We just need his advice. We need his leading, his guiding, his provision. So let's pray. Father God, we lift up President Trump, Vice President Mike Pence. We pray for our Senate. We pray for our House of Representatives. We pray for the governors of all the states. The police officers, it's a trying time. And there are some people in the, in the country that are trying to use this for their gain. And I pray, the Lord, that you would bring their, their desires to nothing. We pray, Lord, for this to be a time of revival where, yes, there's a virus out there. And it's funny because, Lord, there are people that say they, don't, they can't believe in a God they can't see, but they certainly are reacting greatly to a virus they can't see. And your effect on the planet has been much greater than any virus's effect. And we know, Lord, that you are greater than this virus. We know that you are greater than any sickness, any ill, anything we can have. One of the most terrifying diseases in your day, Jesus, when you were here was leprosy. And people just kept everybody apart from each other. And yet you were unafraid to not only be close, but to touch and to minister so, Lord, we ask that you will touch and minister, that you will help us to, um, if we can't eradicate a virus, that we can control it through medication, through whatever you choose to do. We know that you can do it. We know that you can miraculously speak it into existence, and this virus will be gone. So we have faith and we have trust in you. We're not expecting that to happen. We're expecting you to be God and for us to acknowledge you as God. That will never change. And we thank you that you are consistent, that your word says you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we can depend on that. So, Lord, in this, un these uncertain times, I thank you for the certainty of you, for the certainty of your word, for the certainty of the fact that we are sinners in a sinful world, and we are all uh, deserving of eternal punishment but because of your great love and your grace and your mercy, you sent Jesus to be our Savior, to redeem us when we not only didn't know we needed redeeming, didn't want redeeming, but we didn't have redemption, and you came, and you made a way for us to be able to spend eternity with the one we didn't even know about. So thank you, Lord. And Lord, as we look to your word, we ask that you would minister to us through it, Help us to understand you a little better than before, and maybe a lot better, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're in the Gospel of John today. If you want to open your Bible to John's Gospel, chapter 8, and we'll pick it up in verse 48 of John, chapter 8. And once you find that, I've done this before, there are two other scripture references I want you to turn to. One of them is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and when you find that one, which is farther toward the back from the Gospel of John, once you find 2 Corinthians chapter 5, then I want you to go way toward the front of the Bible and find Exodus chapter 3. And when, when we want to turn here, when I want you to turn, I'll, I'll give you notice, but 2 Corinthians 5, Exodus chapter 3, but we're going to begin in John chapter 8, verse 48. But before that, 
I'm going to read this to you. It says, George Bush died and went to heaven, and St. Peter met him at the gates. George asked St. Peter if the people in heaven were as friendly as the people in Texas were. Well, St. Peter said, sure they are. Well, George goes for a walk and passes by Moses, and he decides to speak to him. Moses just looks the other way and keeps on walking. Well, slightly upset by this, George goes back to St. Peter and tells him what happened with Moses. St. Peter seemed confused, so he sought out Moses and asked him why he ignored Mr. Bush. Well, Moses looked St. Peter in the eye and said, Well, Peter, you, if you remember, the last time I spoke to a bush, I spent 40 years in the wilderness. Now, here's the part where you laugh. If you were all here, I'd be able to have that time. It's one of the awkward things about teaching online, mostly, is that you don't get the response. Or it would be the time where all of us would hear the crickets that are in the room. I'm not sure, but I'm going to go on. The reason I use that title or that story is because we'll be getting into the time when God was talking to Moses through the burning bush. And so I call this message, I am, I said, with a little nod to uh, Neil Diamond in the song he had, but I am, I said. So verse 48, then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. What an amazing section. So it starts off in 48. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you have a demon, uh, that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? <clears throat> I said, Well, well, well. Previously, in verse 41, the Jewish leaders accused Jesus of being an illegitimate son. That's a nice way to put it. And while we know from Scripture that he most certainly wasn't illegitimate, at least we can see how, in the natural, from their point of view, they could come to such a conclusion. See, Mary and Joseph weren't married. They were just betrothed, and Mary was pregnant. So they assumed that Jesus was an illegitimate child, and apparently that rumor, that idea, followed Jesus around. But that accusation didn't work. Jesus knew the truth and simply said he came from God the Father. So now the Jews are frustrated again. So they resorted to an age-old tactic, name-calling, what bullies always resort to when everything else fails. They called Jesus Christ a demon-possessed Samaritan. Now, Don Stewart, in case you're wondering about the Samaritans, Don Stewart, a Bible teacher of our day, uh, talks about who the Samaritans were. Quote, the Samaritans were a group of people who lived in Samaria, an area north of Jerusalem. They were half Jews and half Gentiles. When Assyria captured the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC, most were taken in captivity while some were left behind. The ones left behind intermarried with the Assyrians. Thus, these people were neither fully Hebrews nor fully Gentiles. The Samaritans had their own unique copy of the first five books of Scripture, as well as their own unique system of worship, unquote. I would also say they had their own place of worship. After the exile in Babylon, now, when Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of the city, it was the Samaritans 
who vigorously opposed him. This was the beginning of the hatred for the Samaritans that the Jews had. They would have disliked them before because many Jews had a superiority complex being God's chosen people and all. But the opposition, this opposition, <coughs> excuse me, took it to extreme heights of hate. And it was still very much alive in the time of Jesus. And so this was a racial slur that they used. But even worse, you have a demon? As I said, when they called Jesus an illegitimate child, wow, just wow. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, though, has a demon? No, but they did say it. As I said, they resorted to name calling. It's in the handbook for bullies under, you find it under this category. What do you say when the other guy frustrates you with the truth? <laughs> well, in a way, they were saying Jesus had to be insane. And that's why they said he had a demon. He wasn't in his right mind. Because they figured only a, only a man who was out of his mind could say the things about himself that Jesus was saying. Jesus had told them that their father was the devil and they did his desires. So they're returning the favor in a very unfavorable way. So naturally, Jesus has a response for him. He doesn't, he's not going to stand there and just take it. He's going to share truth. Verse 49, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. Yeah, very plainly, very clearly, Jesus set him straight. He does not and he cannot, which is one word, but you can say can not. I tried to type it in my Word document and it gave a little squiggly thing. It wouldn't let me say can not. I mean, it would. I can override it, but still, it's kind of funny to me. But he cannot have a demon. In fact, if you printed off the notes from the um, website or from Facebook, you saw that I put can slash not have a demon. But every believer has been bought with the price of the blood of Christ. Every believer has. We are owned by him, literally. We are not our own anymore. 1 Corinthians 6.19, the Apostle Paul wrote, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? So God will not let us be demon-possessed. Jesus doesn't treat us like some lousy timeshare property, okay? He doesn't say, well, I get them on the weekends and every other Christmas. No, that's not it. Jesus is God. He doesn't share us with the devil. So it's logical for us to believe that Jesus himself cannot be demon-possessed. In fact, it's the opposite. He says, but I honor my Father, he says, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father. No one who is demon-possessed would ever honor God the Father. In fact, it would be quite the opposite. So Jesus is saying that his honoring the Father rules out demon possession. Charles Spurgeon said this, quote, No man can be said to have a devil who honors God, for the evil spirit from the beginning has been the enemy of all that glorifies the Father, unquote. So there's just, it, it's an impossibility. But he did address their conclusions. He says, and you dishonor me. And since he'd already claimed to be God, what is he saying? You're dishonoring God. Because Jesus knows exactly who he is. Any claim by anyone that isn't true, especially this one, this claim is dishonoring him. Now the Jews, they dishonored Jesus, even though that determined their eternal destiny pretty sad and then jesus goes on in verse 50 and i do not seek my own glory well the jews certainly didn't seek to glorify jesus and jesus didn't seek to glorify himself everything he did was to bring glory to his father in heaven however we can and should bring glory to jesus in fact I had somebody ask me years ago, they said, what is the purpose of your church? And I said, the purpose of this church is to glorify God. I had to think about this for a while. I, had to, I wanted to formulate a really good answer. So I said, the purpose of this church, there's only one. The purpose is to glorify God. And I said, within that purpose, we have two duties. One, we minister to, we take care of the people who come here. And two, 
we do our best to minister to and take care of those outside of our church. So that takes care of believers within the church and believers and non-believers outside the church. So that's where all the ministry comes from. Those are two purposes, but they're all led and I don't want to say driven, but they're focused on, they're guided by our desire to have everything we do glorify God the Father. Now, will everything we do glorify God? I'd say no. Not because we don't want it to, but because we're people and we make mistakes. <laughs> but God can even take our mistakes and bring glory to himself. That's how big he is. And that is a wonderful thing. So we don't seek our own glory. We seek to glorify God the Father. And then Jesus finishes verse 50. He says, there is one who seeks and judges. God the Father sought glory for his beloved son, for Jesus. And he would judge all of those who failed to give Jesus the proper glory. That's one of the reasons why this church wants to glorify God, because we don't want to be judged by God because what we did was to make us look good or to bring us glory or, or to bring any person glory or any favoritism or anything like that. No, it all has to be about Jesus. Now, now Jesus makes another statement that the Jews would have a hard time with. He was pretty good at that. Verse 51, most assuredly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Now, this is a promise of Jesus, a promise that's based on our behavior. The behavior we must participate is, is this, participate in is this. If anyone keeps my word. No, keeps is, it indicates continuing in the word of God. It isn't just owning a copy and having it on your shelf or um, on your nightstand or a coffee table, a big family Bible. That isn't what keeps means. Keeps means it's in, con, indicating, continuing in it, learning it, living it, obeying it. In fact, Jesus uses this term 15 times in the Bible, referring to keeping or obeying his word each time. Now, I'd go so far as to say that when Jesus says something once, it's important. <laughs> if he says it 15 times, he's kind of like, politely, lovingly, like Biff from Back to the Future, getting us in that chokehold. Hello, McFly, keep my word. <laughs> it's just, he, got, he has to get that through to us. We need to do this. He's given us this word for so many reasons, and the biggest one is to know him and to obey him, so we need to keep his word. In fact, one of those 15 times is John 14, verse 15. He says, if you love me, do what you want? No. If you love me, keep my commandments. Keeping the same thing indicates obeying it, learning it, and living it. That's what we have to do, his commandments. And the promises, what is the promise that when we do keep his word, we shall never see death? Well, two things here to know. The word see means to ascertain or to find out by seeing. Now, Brooke Foss Westcott, I just learned about this guy this week, he wrote this, the word see means a long, steady, exhaustive vision, whereby we become slowly acquainted with the nature of the object to which it is directed. In other words, it's more than just taking a glance, seeing it, like driving in a car and you see a like out, out in the country, you see a neat farm, a barn, a bunch of cattle, some goats, whatever. You see it, and then poof, you're gone. That's not what it's talking about. What it is, it's absorbing it. It's experiencing it permanently. And what are you seeing? Death. <clears throat> if you obey his word, you never see permanently death. Well, Death does not mean physically dying. It means the misery of the soul arising from sin, which begins on earth but lasts and after the death of the body increases in hell. That's the type of death that we will not even have to, we will not experience permanently. Jesus is talking about eternal death, what Revelation 20 verse 14 calls the second death because the first one is a physical one the second one this is a spiritual death 
Now, British theologian, I love this, Alexander McLaren has a good news uh, quote about death for the Christian. He said this, Death is but a passage. It is not a house. It is only a vestibule. The grave has a door on its inner side. Unquote. I love that. Imagine six foot deep grave and they lower the sarcophagus in and they bury it only to like a magician the back opens up and the guy gets out and goes to eternity with the Lord it's just so cool I love that idea death the physical death is not the end and it's the first death is physical death for the believer there is no second death but this Jesus is talking about he says if you love me um Keep, keep his word, we'll never see death. We will never take that long, experiential, eternal look at death and misery in hell. That's what Jesus is saying. This is what the statement of Jesus really boils down to. Every Christian, every person who asks Jesus into his heart and accepts Jesus as his Savior and his Lord will escape hell. Not only that, they get to experience heaven forever and as the bible puts it so well so many times when it doesn't say when he forever runs out but that's kind of what it means because we use that term loosely but it says forever and ever just in case you think forever isn't long enough you get ever now there's a statement like this by jesus is when he makes a statement like this it's bound to get a reaction from the jews and you know what they don't disappoint Verse 52, then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. <laughs> Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Well, first of all, they misquoted Jesus. Not an uncommon thing for the enemies of Jesus to do. What Jesus said was, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. But they quoted him as saying, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. There's a difference. We already know what is meant by see. It's an eternal thing. It's a long, drawn-out time of learning. Permanent. But the Jews said that Jesus said, taste death, which means to taste, to try the flavor of. I don't i'm not i'm not a chef i would never try to get a job as a chef i guess i would if i didn't have anything else to do and i don't mean bored i mean if i had to take a job as a chef i would if they'd hire me unlikely but when i do cook things i like to taste them to see if they're going to be just right and that's what it means just a little bit just to taste they said you won't, you said people won't even taste death because there's a difference between tasting and eating David Guzik says this, quote, Jesus said that the one who keeps his word would never stare death face to face. They claimed, he said, that this one would never taste death. The believer will indeed taste death, but he's not terrorized by this defeated foe. See, that's one of the things that Jesus defeated, not only sin, and he conquered that, but the consequences of sin. He defeated death. Death is the great unknown for us. I mean, we, we have a lot of information about it in the, in the Bible, and we get told ahead of time. But I don't know too many people who run around so excited that one day they're going to die. One day they're going to be dead. I've said this many times. I, like, I, like, I have a dead wish, so to speak, because I know that when I'm dead, I'm going to be with the Lord but I don't have a dying wish. I don't want to go through the process. I'm not looking forward to that. Not at all. I know many Christians, though, who have tasted physical death. But physical death is not the end for the Christian. It's actually the beginning. The Apostle Paul, the one who wrote much of the New Testament, struggled with life here on earth in one respect. He said in Philippians 1, 23 and 24, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. You see, he didn't mind the idea of tasting death, of 
going through the dying process because he knew where he was going. There's a section in scripture that talks about Paul wrote, he says, I know a man, whether it was in the flesh or the spirit, I don't know. Whether this happened or this, I don't know. But he was taken up to heaven, and he saw things, and he, things he couldn't even write about, things he couldn't express, things he couldn't understand. And I interpret it this way. Paul, we know physically, he was stoned in a city. They dragged him out of the city. He was dead. And then the believers around him gathered around and were praying, and Paul came back to life. But while he was dead is when he was taken to heaven. He saw heaven. And when he was put back in his body, his soul back in, and he came back to life, you know what he did? He got up and he went right back in the same city where they had stoned him because what he, I believe what he was thinking was this. You know what? I've seen heaven. I can go through anything down here. I can do anything. I can be as bold as I need to be because I know what we're going to go to. I've seen it. And so Paul wasn't that concerned about going through the dying process because he knew what was on the other side. That's the promise for us as believers. In fact, now's the time, you, if you have your Bible turn, marked there, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we'll start in verse 1. So 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, and a tent is what? It's a temporary dwelling. When you, I know some people take motor homes that are like a house, but a lot of times people go camping, they go in a tent because it's a temporary dwelling. And it's all exciting and it's fun, but a lot of times by the end of a weekend or a week, you're like, man, I want to get home to my house. This is not where I live. This isn't my home. Remember when the wind was blowing, when it was raining, it was cold, the tent leaked, some things are going wrong. The zipper doesn't quite work like it used to. The poles are not st holding up straight. The stakes broke off in the dirt. The ropes are wearing out. All these things that happen to tents when they get older. This tent, it's a great picture. This is a temporary dwelling. So he said, if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, meaning when we die, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, not a human being type body, an eternal body that's designed for eternity, God is going to put us in, create for us, and we'll live in that instead. For in this, this one we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. We won't be there either out of a body or not in the right body. We'll be in the right ones. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. How about that? This is the time when mortality is on a lot of people's minds because mortality means what? That we're going to die. And there are people dying from this virus. The virus doesn't seem to be affecting a huge number of people, but a lot of the people that are affected by it, the ones that are dying, are going, nurses and doctors and medical professionals are saying that what happens to their lungs is terrible, and it's, it's an awful way to die. So we don't want that to happen, but this mortality will be swallowed up by not the grave, but by life in eternity. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. It means like a down payment, like earnest money on a house. If you want to buy a house, they expect you to put some money down on it. Let's, let's see if whether or not you are serious. Because if you put money down on it, money's important to you, you're going to make sure and carry out the transaction. You're going to get the loan, and you're going to get approved, and you're going to move in. Well, God is the one who gave us earnest money in a way by sending his Holy Spirit to live with us. That's why Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away. If I go away, I'll send the Holy Spirit, and he will come and live in each one of you, because when I'm here now on earth in this body, I can only be one place at a time. But the Holy Spirit can be everywhere in the world simultaneously in every believer, as powerful as he needs to be in every believer. Fantastic. Talk about the best earnest money ever. That's it. So he says in verse 6, So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. So while we're here, walking around, doing our thing, well, not doing too many things right now with the lockdown, but you know what I mean. While we're living here on planet Earth, we're absent from the Lord. 
not be in the, the terms of the Holy Spirit living with us, but we're not face-to-face with them. We're not walking on those streets of gold and the, w- looking at the gates of pearl and looking at the beauty of who Jesus is. We're not doing that now. We're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Because what do we see now? Nothing. I don't see heaven. I don't see Jesus. I see Jesus working through people. I know Jesus because I've trusted him as my Savior and Lord. I find him on every page of the Bible, and he reveals stuff to me, things about himself every time I read it. But I haven't physically, with my eyes, seen him. We walk by faith and not by sight. In verse 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. In other words, he says, hey, we're not just confident. It makes us happy knowing that when we're absent from the body, when we die, we're present with the Lord. So that is a promise that God gives us. Okay, so back to John 8. See, the ultimate destination for the Christian, which is seeing Jesus, Jesus is the one who makes heaven, heaven. All these other promises about it are great. I don't want to diminish it. I don't want God to say, oh, you don't want that? Fine, I'll take it away. No, I think it'd be great to have all those things. And we're going to. But Jesus is the one who makes heaven really cool, really awesome. Okay, so back to John 8. The Jews got this wrong, and they didn't understand what Jesus was saying. Verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Well, the first question there, the quick, easy answer is yes. Jesus is greater than anyone ever. And as far as the dead people they mentioned, they said, Abraham's dead. The prophets are dead. Well, Mark 12, 26 and 27, Jesus himself said, But concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage? How God spoke to him, spoke to Moses, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. You see, he didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, I was the God of Isaac, and I was the God of Jacob. He says, no, I am because they are with him. And Jesus stood on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was changed. And who was he talking to? Elijah and Moses. They were still still around. So, he's the God of the living. And eternity is the ultimate goal. And so when you die physically here, yes, your body's dead. But you didn't die. And that's what they were, how, how they were greatly mistaken here. Which led to the, end, the question at the end of verse 53, they thought, wondering who he is, who do you make yourself out to be? Well, I'll say this. Jesus is greater than all the prophets combined. He's the one who came to deliver mankind from eternal death. Now, unfortunately for them, they have refused to believe his answer. But they figured that the proof, they figured that this statement, that the thing by him, was proof that he was demon-possessed. But you know what? Jesus gives them an answer anyway. Verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. So before he answers their question about who he is, and he's going to get to it, He backs up and readdresses the question of his spiritual parentage. You see, because honoring yourself is easy. A lot of people do it, and most of the time we don't like it. But we do have a saying about it. That is, if you can back it up, it's not bragging. (laughs) It's just a fact. Jesus certainly could back up his spiritual parentage claim But he didn't have to because his Father in heaven did it for him. And Jesus ended this verse by stating something that should have meant they they agreed with his statement about his spiritual parentage. He says, of whom you say that he is your God. See, the key word is say, whom you 
say, air quotes, I don't know if Jesus did that, but it would be kind of funny for us, whom you say that he is your God. They said God was their God, but you know what? They didn't live it. In fact, there was a time when Jesus said, you know, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they sit in Moses' seat. In other words, they have authority, and they should. They're in the position of having that authority. That's good. And what they teach you from the word is right. Believe that. Live it. But the way they act, mm -mm. don't live the way they live. Do what they say from Scripture, but don't live like they do because they don't live it, so don't follow their example. That is a huge indictment, and I pray that I don't live that way, and I pray that no pastor does because if you don't back up the teaching that you yourself teach with your life, well, it nullifies an awful lot of what you teach. Not what the Word says, but it can nullify the effect on people's lives. They can say, well, what's this? He was saying this and doing this, and we had to, we had to follow this, and it was hard for us, and then we look at him, and he doesn't live that way? That's crazy. So no, it's so important to live what the Word says so you're a good example to people. And Jesus, of course, was obviously the best one. So now Jesus addresses what they're getting into, verse 55. Yet you have not know him, known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, oh boy, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. I said, ow. In my notes, I said, ouch. Jesus says they don't know God, but Jesus does. He's saying, you don't know him, but I do. And here they were speaking with the one who did know God the Father, the one who was equal with him. And they wanted Jesus to deny his equality with the Father. But he said, if he did that, well, then I'd, just, I'd be a liar just like you. I can't do that. That's not who I am. I am God. And if I said I'm not, I'm a liar like you. Really, Jesus, how do you feel about that? <laughs> of course, Jesus didn't do that because he is God. In Hebrews 6, 18, as we went over last week, says it is impossible for God to lie. So he has to tell the truth. And just to be sure they understood this, he finished it with this. But I do know him and keep his word. So earlier, Jesus tells us we need to obey. We need to keep his word. Here he says he keeps the Father's word, and Jesus is always our best example. And now Jesus engages them with a preliminary strike before the big bomb. This isn't the big bomb. That'll come in a couple of verses, but it's a preliminary strike. It's kind of softening up the belly like a boxer does before he pops you. Verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad this is an amazing statement on the eternal nature of jesus abraham's life is written about in the book of genesis the first book of the entire bible the dates abraham lived were around 2000 years or so before jesus came maybe even farther ago than that so thinking in the natural there was no way Abraham could have not only seen Jesus but rejoiced in his day but Abraham or Jesus rather said Abraham saw his day and he rejoiced and we've already established that Jesus can't lie so we have to find out how did this happen he said it so it had to have happened now, Warren Wiersbe has a quote that explains how Abraham saw the major events in the ministry of Christ. Warren Wiersbe said this, quote, How did Abraham see our Lord's day, that is, his life and ministry on earth? The same way he saw the future city, by faith. God did not give Abraham some special vision of our Lord's life and ministry, but he did give him the spiritual perception to see in a way, these future events. Certainly Abraham saw the birth of the Messiah in the miraculous birth of his own son, Isaac. He certainly saw Calvary when he offered up Isaac to God. In the priestly ministry of Melchizedek, Abraham could see the, event, the heavenly priesthood of the Lord, and in the marriage of Isaac, Abraham could see a picture of the marriage of the Lamb, unquote. 
Jesus was saying that he was the one that Abraham saw when he looked forward. Abraham's faith rested in the coming of the Redeemer, whom we know of as Christ. Now, when Abraham obeyed God and was going to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, he could see a picture of Christ. When Abraham was visited by Melchizedek, he could have seen a picture of Christ. John Corson says this, quote, I believe this reference is to the story in Genesis 14 when, after rescuing his nephew, Abraham was greeted by a man named Melchizedek. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Melchizedek was from Salem. Salem means peace. This, by the way, just interject here, it's where the term Jerusalem comes from. Okay, Hebrews 7.3 tells us Melchizedek had no mother or father or beginning or end. He offered bread and wine to Abraham and accepted a tithe from him, all of which point to the distinct possibility that Melchizedek was what's called a Christophany, an earthly appearance of Jesus before he came as a babe of Bethlehem. Unquote. At the beginning of this gospel, John told us that Jesus is the one who actually created everything. Now, since that is true, not if, but since Jesus is the creator and he spoke everything into existence, is it so hard for us to believe that Jesus, being eternal in nature, could have appeared to Abraham so long before he himself was born in Bethlehem? It's not hard for me to understand that at all. He was the one who did the creating of everything in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. He's the one who created Adam and Eve. Why couldn't he appear to Abraham? It's not hard to say that at all. So no matter how it happened, he says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So whatever the circumstances were, that happened because Jesus said it, so it's true. And it sure did fire up the Jewish leaders. Verse 57, then the Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? You see, they couldn't understand this. Not thinking in the natural. Jesus was 33 or so years old here. Abraham lived somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 years before them. As the robot says in the old Lost in Space series, used to that does not compute. <laughs> it doesn't work. Now, why did they pick not yet 50 years old? Did they just grab a, a year out of the air? Well, possibly. And it is a round number, and Jesus wasn't even 50 years old yet. But William Barclay says this. It's interesting. Quote, how, they demanded, can you have seen Abraham when you were not yet 50? Then he says, goes on to say, why 50? Well, Numbers 4 verse 3 tells us that was the age at which the Levites retired from their service. So the Jews would have been saying to Jesus, you're a young man, still in the prime of life, not even old enough to retire from service. How can you possibly have seen Abraham? This is mad talk, unquote. Well, if they thought that was crazy, hang on to your hats. Verse 58. Here comes the bomb. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> Boom. That would be mic drop time. <laughs> now this sounds like bad grammar. This I am. But it's not, and I'll show you why. Turn to Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. This is what I, why I asked you to turn there and mark it. So Exodus chapter 3, and if you happen to have one of these loner Bibles that we have at our church, that'd be on page 63. So go to page 63, and it'll help you to find it. Verse 13, Moses had been great in Egypt, and then when he was 40 years old, God called him to redeem his people, to rescue them, to get them out of there. And so Moses took matters into his own hands and murdered an Egyptian, and then Pharaoh heard, heard about it and was going to kill him, so he ran away. So that's 40 years in, the wilderness, in, the, uh, in Egypt. Now he's been 40 years in the wilderness tending sheep as a shepherd. So that some people say it took God 40 years. It took Moses 40 years to become great in his own eyes. It took God 40 years to find, for Moses to realize he wasn't anything 
so then he could use him for 40 years in ministry. So he's at this second 40 years. So in other words, he's 80 years old. He's out tending sheep in the desert. And he looks over and he sees a bush on fire. And he's like, well, you know, it is the desert. It's no big deal. And then he looks back and he sees it's still burning. He's like, that's kind of weird. And then he looks and he sees it's still burning. It's not consumed. He says, I need to go check this thing out. See, God used a natural thing, a bush burning, but in an unnatural way to get Moses' attention. For some people, for some guys, it'd have to be a shiny car, you know, a new Jeep, a truck. I'm going to go see that. A great uh, gun. I don't know. Whatever would get your attention. Big screen TV, something to go and check out. But the burning bush is what brought him there, and he got near, and that's when the bush talked to him. That ties into the story at the beginning of the message. But the bush is talking to him because it's God in the bush, and he tells him to take off your sandals Because the ground you're standing on is holy. The presence of God made the ground holy. Now, it isn't that God didn't want Moses, like, don't track your dirty dirt on my holy dirt. No. He wanted intimacy with Moses. He wanted Moses' skin to touch the holy ground. So he did. He took off his sandals, and he was standing there, and he's talking with the bush. And the bush, God tells him, I want you to redeem my people. I've heard their cry. You need to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let him go, the whole story. So Moses says he wants to know, who will I say sent me? Because they may not believe me. So verse 13, then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, well, what's his name? I don't know if that that would be a quiz or they're just curious. But they said, what's his name? Then he said, then they will say to me, what's his name? What shall I say to them? In other words, what's your name? I don't know if Moses just wanted to know the name and found a clever way to ask, but that's what he asked. And verse 14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, I've often said this. In fact, I usually use the same name. It's kind of like, why didn't he say Larry (laughs) sent me or Bob or Jim, Frank, uh, uh, Ezekiel, pick a biblical type name. But he said, I am. But really, it's the perfect name because thousands of years ago, when Moses is standing there, he's I am, current present tense we read it thousands of years later his name is i am it's current it's the god of what's going on now he is the god and and it's all through time he's still i am to moses back then and as much as he is i am right now see god's not outdated god isn't out of touch because literally he's been around forever i mean we use that term but he really has But God doesn't lose touch. God doesn't get out of style. God doesn't say, I don't understand these people today. No, he knows everything about us and he knows why better than we do. He's the God of what's going on now. So anything you're going through, he knows all about it and he has the solution. Like in the book of Genesis when God said it's not right for man to be alone because Adam had named, Adam was going to, he realized they were all alone. So Adam was brought all the animals and he named each animal, each one had a male and a female. They all had partners. But Adam realized there's only one of me. God already saw that. He said, I'm going to make him a helper. So here's the point with that. And then he made a helper, took, made, took one of his ribs and made Eve. Bef- when, by, the point, by the time you get to the point of noticing a need of yours, a problem, God has already seen it and has the solution. So we have a need, this virus. God has already seen it, and he has the solution. We just have to wait for him to show it to us. Okay, so back into John chapter 8. It's interesting to me that God chose, before we continue on, God chose to use the name I Am. I was talking with some Jehovah's Witnesses who deny the deity of Jesus And in the burning bush passage, God says, I am. 
But here they say, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I have been. What? Because they believe that God the Father created Jesus, and then Jesus took over and created everything else. So he is not the eternal God. He's a God made after God the Father. And I guess we would be children of a lesser God, pardon the book and movie title, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. It's not what Jesus said. It's not what any grammarian in, in grammar of uh, Greek studies would understand this to be. Jesus is claiming that he is God Almighty by saying this. There's a saying in many people in America use today, and that is, it is what it is. The phrase means it happened. We can't change it. We have to move on. Well, God is I am who I am, and he can't be changed. So we don't want to move on. We want to grab a hold of that and have him be our God. William Barclay again said this, quote, We must note carefully that Jesus did not say, Before Abraham was, I was. No, he said, Before Abraham was, I am. Here is the claim that Jesus is timeless. There never was a time when he came into being. There never will be a time when he is not in being. He always has been and he always will be. Okay, John eight fifty eight. are you ready for this one? When Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, there's a little more I want to share about this. It's such a big one. He was saying more than just the fact that he was in existence back then, making him eternal in nature. He was also saying that one of their heroes, in one of the most important conversations on the planet ever in history, Moses was actually speaking, when he was speaking to God, he was speaking to me, is what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, remember that whole burning bush, God talking with Moses thing? That was me. I was the one who talked to him. Again, Mike, drop. <laughs> and let me tell you this. Sad that they didn't believe him. But they completely understood what he was saying. And that is the defense that I used with that Jehovah's Witness guy when he told me that, showed me that before Abraham was, I have been. I said right after that, they picked up stones to stone him. And he says, well, they didn't understand what he was saying. He wasn't calling himself God Almighty. And I went, I can't, I can't share with you anymore. <laughs> they completely understood what he was saying. The Jews did. Verse 59, then they took up stones to throw at him. And I put down on my notes, why? Because they were legalists. And the law said in Leviticus 24, 16, that a blasphemer was to be stoned to death. Any man who has called himself God has blasphemed. Except Jesus, because he was not just any man. He was God in the flesh. He was just stating the truth. So did they succeed in stoning him? We know he died. But Jesus, going on in 59, hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So the quick answer is no. They didn't succeed. They didn't stone him. Somehow, Jesus hid from them, left the temple, but he did it right through their midst. Maybe they were busy picking up stones, and they turned up, and they're like, he was here a minute ago. Where did he go? Now, why did Jesus leave? We know he wasn't afraid to die, because he not only faced the cross, he not only went to the cross, he orchestrated it. He wasn't caught off guard. He said, I laid down my life and I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. It's not, it's not a surprise. He actually put the things in motion that caused them to crucify him. It's just because it wasn't his time to die. Remember John chapter 7, verse 30. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. You see, very soon his hour would come, and they would crucify him without even knowing that he died for their sins. And you know who else he died for? He died for your sins as well. So here's this story. 
excuse me, historical account. <laughs> I don't want to make it sound like it's a fairy tale because it's not. Conversation back and forth. They say you have a demon. He says, no, I don't have a demon. They say you're not God. He says, yes, I am God. In fact, are you greater than our father Abraham? You say that these people won't die if they believe in you. He says, well, actually, Abraham, your hero, rejoice to see my day. What? You're not even 50. He says, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll do better than that. You know, you know who was talking to Moses? That was me. They're like, ah, they get rocks to kill him. What are you going to do with this information? Because clearly from this scripture section here, we see that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. And what does Jesus say? What does his word say? We're all sinners. Every one of us. I'm a sinner. Have been, am, will be until the day that I die. When you become a Christian, your sins are forgiven. And you don't become sinless like it's one word. We'll split that up and you just sin less and less and less and less. So if you're a Christian and you're worried about why you're sinning, it's because welcome to the human race. Now, there is time for repentance and there is time for mourning over your sin and saying, God, I'm sorry, and confessing sin, yes, and slowing down and sinning less and less and less. But you're never going to stop. It's not encouragement to do so. It's just a reality check. But what are you going to do about your sin if you haven't had it forgiven, if you haven't asked Jesus to be your Savior, if you're not guaranteed of heaven for eternity? What are you going to do? Well, there is one thing that you can do, and it's only one. And if it sounds narrow-minded, well, as one guy said, you can afford to be narrow-minded if you're right. <laughs> the truth of Scripture is God created this place. We sinned, messed it up, and he came and redeemed us. So it's his way of redemption that we need to comply with. So what do we have to do? What's this great deal what what's this amazing thing that we have to do do we have to climb mountains and and push things up a hill and or climb up stairs on our bare knees until they bleed to prove that we're worthy no because there's nothing we can do that's worthy all we have to do is acknowledge that we're not worthy acknowledge that jesus is god that he came to earth that he lived a sinless life that he died in your place on the cross as the perfect sacrifice for your sins that he died Three days later, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and has promised to come back for us. You make him your Savior and your Lord. You accept that punishment for your sins because his body, what it went through, was because of what you did wrong, what I did wrong. It's a simple thing. All you have to do is accept him as your Savior and Lord. People think, I don't want to give up all this fun. But if you recognize that you need a Savior, you recognize that not everything you've done is good for you. And if you don't want a Lord, just think back to this. If you recognize your need for a Savior, then you need a Lord. You need both. So all you have to do is ask Jesus to come into your life. And I have a simple prayer that I'm going to pray. So if you want to do that, I'm going to give you a chance right now. I know I've been doing this every week, and I pray that it never gets old. If you also want to restart your walk with Jesus, if you also want to as I like to say, re-up, like you finish the end of your two years or three years or four years in military and you sign up to continue. If you want to recommit your life to Jesus, you can pray this prayer as well. This is what you have to do. Repeat this prayer after me. It's very simple. And don't worry about anybody else who may be in the room. Don't worry about what they may be thinking. Just pray it. Say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm not perfect, and my sins keep me from you. I need you in my life. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Please come into my heart and be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me new life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I do want to close with this. If, if you just prayed that prayer, if it's the first time you ever prayed that, I want to be the first one to say welcome to God's family. It's so cool because you may not have a good family on earth. You may have the best one ever, but you also now have a big extended family. You're in the family of God. And if you, wanted, if you just re-upped, congratulations again. Now, I want to say this. There's a possibility you didn't feel anything. 
when this happened. Some people feel a great rush and be like, wow, that's so awesome. Other people are like, did anything happen? Well, here's the truth of Scripture. If you ask Jesus to come in, he comes in. He comes in in the person of the Holy Spirit. That down payment I was mentioning earlier is now in you, a promise of eternity, whether you felt anything or not. So don't think, oh, I didn't feel anything, so it must not be real. It's like, it's like, it's not like jumping in a pool and you're, you know you're going to get wet. <laughs> it's jumping into God's arms. Whether you feel it or not, it happened. And if you did that, could you let us know? You can go to our website, which is calvarycuna.org, and you can submit a prayer request and just tell us that that happened. We just want to rejoice with you. Or you can leave a comment on our Facebook live feed. Or if you're watching this later, you can leave a comment at any time. We would just love to rejoice with you. And if you need any help, if there's anything that we can do for you, send a Bible to you if you don't own one. Whatever it is, we just want to be there for you because we want to minister. We want to do what God says. So anyway, God bless you. Have a good week until we see you again. Thanks.